Bender. Welcome back to the Beetle Moment Marketing Podcast. I am here with my very special guest, Steve Pratt. He is the vice president and co-founder of Pacific Content, a company of 30 passionate podcast nerds that focuses exclusively on creating original podcasts with brands. Pacific Content joined Rogers Media in May 2019. They are one of Entrepreneur's 100 Brilliant Companies. Their shows have won Webby Awards, Digiday Branded Content Awards, all kinds of awards. Their podcast partners include Facebook, Dell Technologies, Mozilla, Slack, Red Hat, BMW, CBS, Charles Schwab, and more. Hi, Steve. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, really excited to be here. I'm excited to talk with you. As we were discussing before we started recording here, I have been following you for probably five years or so, ever since I started hearing about some of the podcasts that you and Pacific Content were putting out. Trailblazers, one of my all-time favorites. Um, other ones like Relate and some of the branded content that you've worked on before. So it's really cool to finally connect and have this conversation with you. Well, it's nice to meet you too, because um, I'm a big fan of, of smart speakers in general, and you are a, a wonderful source of information and insight about it. So uh, yeah, nice to connect. Thank you. Well, tell me, what is your background and uh, how did you get to start working on branded content and podcasts? Yeah, it's a, it's a very strange uh, route. So I, I had a, a long career in traditional media. So I did about 10 years of TV uh, in a really random mix of different types of subject matter from kind of, a, you know, music video station, children's programming, local news, an entertainment journalist. Uh, as the internet picked up, I, I spent a little bit of time at AOL doing digital only content uh, strategy and execution. And then I spent about 10 years at Canada's public broadcaster, uh, CBC, running a digital music service. And it was kind of an innovation lab around trying to figure out audio for younger demographics using a lot of digital platforms. And one of them was satellite radio. And we were waiting about a year before the Sirius XM came into Canada and launched. And it was the fall of 2004. And we had our, our goal was to promote emerging Canadian indie music. And so we had all these artists that owned their own rights and our job was to promote them. And we started hearing this thing called the Daily Source Code uh, from Adam Curry, which is the, one of the first ever podcasts out there. And uh, we realized, oh, this music is a challenging thing to put in podcasts because of rights and downloads and all those sorts of things. But all these artists own all their own music and we should create a waiver that says if you own it and you give us permission to do it, we'll help promote it in a podcast. So we, we started podcasting in uh, the spring of 2005 and put out, uh, I, I think it was either one of or the first legal music podcast uh, from like from a broadcaster. And it, uh, it did really, really well and got passed around to a lot of different places around the world. And we kind of got bitten by the podcasting bug pretty early. And then uh, I guess, you know, Ed, that was kind of like the first wave of podcasting. And then it, it kind of dipped a little bit in terms of just the buzz worthiness of it, I guess, as things like YouTube and Facebook picked up. And then um, I, I left CBC, I guess, about six years ago to do some consulting around um, how brands can think and act more like media companies. And around that time, Serial came out. And it just, it kind of ignited the second wave of podcasting. And we realized that uh, all the thinking we were doing around helping brands think and act like media companies could apply 100% to podcasts. And we might be able to be first out there to say, we can help turn you into, you know, kind of a media company in audio uh, as a bizarre specialty. Uh, so we, we, we went out and pitched it to Slack. Um, and they said yes after two meetings. They were amazing and just super progressive. And they were the right fit where a lot of people love podcasts inside Slack. And in a few months, we'd kind of launched this, this uh, first original podcast with a brand. And um, it's, we haven't really looked back from there. It's, just, it's, it's been a wonderful little ride of, uh, you know, this second wave of podcasting all, all with brands. Yeah. You have some really impressive brands on your roster too. What is it that these brands understand about the medium or have in common that other companies might not, where they say, yes, this is worth the investment. It's pure content marketing. And something I've noticed that you do so well is it's never overt. It doesn't sound like an ad. It's, it's like gently watermarked from Dell Technologies, from Slack. You know, it's not like 
we are Dell and it's not in your face. Well, I think it's they all, they all understand that you have to put the audience first and you have to have a lot of empathy for the, the people who, that you're creating this for. And that, you, you know, it, anytime anybody makes a piece of content that is about themselves, it, it, you know, it's an infomercial. Uh, and, and really, you should be thinking about how, what is the gift that we can give to our audiences or what's the unique value that we can create as a brand to put it out there that will actually earn the attention and the, and the time of people. Uh, and not just once, it has to be so good that they listen to it once and they want to keep coming back over and over and over again. So it puts a really high bar on the, on the, the quality level that you have to make and also what, what the content is and I, I think everybody that we've worked with um, that's had success in the podcasting space has has really come in and understood that if we make something that's about us, people are maybe they'll listen once and then they'll never come back. So if we're in this, the opportunity to build a really deep relationship with people and to change the way that people think about who we are as a brand um, is is a huge opportunity. But we've got to step up and and make a great show. Yeah. Yeah. What you're talking about branding, I think resonates even more right now because direct response advertising, traditional advertising will be even less effective if we're in a point in our economy where people are spending less and thinking, what do I not need? What can I cut? And I think if you look back in history, the brands that during times like this, don't go dark, don't go silent, but maybe add more value, like you're saying, come out ahead. Um, and I mean, through audio, that that's a really good way to do it because it's so intimate. It's interesting. There's been a phrase that I've heard a few times uh, kind of during this whole pandemic crisis that this is a time for brands to serve instead of sell. It really resonates a lot with me. Like it feels like it's been something that's kind of been in our DNA since our inception, but it's, it's just, it's super clear and really well phrased. I, I feel like uh, to be able to earn attention, that idea of serving instead of selling, you know, at the at the top of the marketing funnel is such an effective strategy. And when it's done well, it leads to getting a big audience and a lot of a lot of engagement and time and attention. And I, I think over time, loyalty that leads to all the other ROI pieces that that people want. It's just it's 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 a patient game of being awesome over time and consistent over time that leads yeah. to all the really big wins. Yeah, completely. Nothing in marketing, in branding is like a Coke machine. It's not that I put in a dollar and I get out a can. It's, it's not that kind of science. It's not like a pay-per-click ad. I mean, this is long-term brand building. I agree with everything you said on that. So with that said, do you ever have clients, these brands that we've mentioned, say to you, well, so what's the return on this? How do you even answer that question when they ask it? Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I, I'll try not to repeat myself on some of this, but you know, a lot of it is unique amount of time spent and, and, and engagement. So we look, I think, you know, my colleague, Dan Meisner is uh, one of the smartest people on the planet with this stuff. And he has this great phrase that, you know, podcasting is an engagement medium, not a reach medium. And so you think about how do you play to the unique strengths of audio and, and what are the benefits of that? A lot of people will come in and say, we want, how many downloads are we going to get? tell us how many downloads we're going to get. And I think the answer is it, it depends. It depends on what show you make and it depends on how you market it. And it depends on the size of your target audience. And it depends on, are you, are you going to talk about yourself? Or are you going to make a great show that, that earns attention of a lot of people? Um, and there's not really a, a benchmark because we've had people who have a target audience of exactly the right 5,000 people. And if they reach those people and they do a great job, it's a massive win for them. And we have some, that are that have massive ma uh, appeal uh, to a broad audience, and they can all be successful. I think the unique thing about audio is when you do it well, you get you know in a in a half hour show an 80, 85, 90, 95 percent completion rate. That's unbelievable compared to any other medium, and the ability to actually have that amount of time and attention given to your brand, and to be able to have your brand in people's ears on a regular cadence for 30 minutes over and over and over again, because you're creating value for them to me is the really unique thing about podcasting. Um, and the other one too, is that you, you reach people where screens can't is that, is that 
I can reach you, you know, maybe not right now on a commute, but normally in a commute is a really valuable way to program your own commute, dog walks, exercising, cooking dinner. Um, you know, I think I, I'm super curious for your thoughts on this. I think we're going to see an increase in smart speaker listening during all this isolation and people trapped in houses where some of that consumption will change. Um, but just to be able to reach people where screens aren't is another really unique win. Yeah, that's a really strong point about having that 30 minutes of, it doesn't even need to be undivided attention because you're listening, not watching, which is the beauty of audio. You can multitask and still consume and comprehend it. Um, yeah, the, the idea of uh, not needing to have a million downloads and, and I think setting up expectations for you want to reach the right audience, not necessarily a huge audience. Um, I, I agree with that. And I've tried to set that expectation with clients too, because everybody wants to be popular and have a, a big reach and grow their audience and many followers and listens and all that, but it doesn't help and it doesn't move the needle if they aren't the right listeners. So. And it is interesting too, like there, I, I should say, I mean, there, it, it, it is a case by case. Like in some ways we look at it that everybody who comes in the door is a fresh problem to solve because they have their own unique challenges that they're, they're looking, you know, like what's the problem we're going to solve with audio today. But there's also just you really unique marketing and audience development strengths that every brand brings to the table. And that that's actually been the most fun, interesting part of, of starting this business is, you know, when you come from a media background, the audience is kind of there by default, you have, a, you have a frequency or you have a distribution through you know, whatever channel you're on and, and their marketing departments and all that sort of thing. In podcasting, everybody starts from zero and podcasts have, um, you know, brand brands doing podcasts have a lot of unfair advantages compared to a lot of other groups in the podcast industry that they can reach a ton of people through their own channels. And so being able to go and figure out how to take large brands and, and almost think like a media company, how would, how would we promote, how would HBO promote a show if, if they had a show and how would you apply that if you're Facebook or Dell or Charles Schwab or Mozilla or those sorts of things. Um, super interesting. And, and when you, when you do activate those channels and you do it well and you promote a great show, you actually can develop a pretty big audience pretty quickly. Um, if, if that's your goal as a brand. So what you just said reminded me of the idea of discovery, which there are over, I think it's about 800,000 podcasts out there, 30 to 40 million episodes. It's not as crowded as the internet, but it is getting increasingly crowded. Everyone has a podcast. Uh, this is something that I, I think of when I talk about flash briefings on Alexa, because there are only 10,000 of those. So it's, it's a much bluer ocean, but still you mentioned promoting it on your other channels. Like if you are BMW or if you are Schwab or, you know, let's say you're doing social, you're doing email you announce your podcast there. You don't expect that people are gonna happen upon it while they're searching in Spotify or Apple Podcasts. So from a marketing standpoint, I mean, what do you think about that kind of discovery challenge or what do you, what do you recommend to brands that you work with who want their podcasts to be discovered? Uh, so there's a ton. Um, so number one, uh, probably goes without saying, make a great show. Like make a great show that is differentiated, that, that is, worth listening to is the number one thing. Number two, we, we almost divide it up into two different lanes of thinking about how you market a show. One is to people who already listen to podcasts. And so that's, you know, almost the lowest hanging fruit is have a paid promotion budget or work out some co-marketing with other podcasts that have the same subject matter and the same target audience that you're looking for and figure out a really creative way of putting someone's next favorite podcast in the most likely place that they're going to discover it. So if, if you're a business podcast and you can get a great recommendation from an other business podcast saying, Hey, check out this amazing new show, you know, they're already podcast listeners and you know, they already like business content. So it's, that's a pretty easy one. Um, but doing a really careful custom paid promotion plan is how to reach existing ones. Uh, the interesting part is that brands can grow a lot of brand new podcast listeners. And so this is where we're thinking about, you know, when we work with Mozilla, they promoted the show in the Firefox browser, uh, like underneath a tab for a search bar. It was like, we have a new podcast and that reached 
just an enormous amount of people. And, you know, at whatever conversion rate that is, it still drove just a crazy amount of traffic for, for people who are qualified and, and were interested in that type of content. Um, Charles Schwab does an amazing job with that in mobile apps, websites, magazines, email newsletters. So you think about all those different pieces and how you, you know, what the most effective way is to let people who are already connected to you as a brand and, and your values know about it. It's not just about preaching to the converted for inside your brand, but those people are actually also wonderful ambassadors to be able to make it easy for them to share and, and start creating the word of mouth piece for it. So um, we kind of try and turn over all the different stones that are possible when, when we're working with companies to be able to um, hit both of those existing listeners and, and grow new ones. Yeah. Growing new ones is something that I've had clients ask me about. Um, and you asked about smart speakers. I'll talk a little about that. So in building a voice experience on Alexa or Google assistant, a lot of people say, I want new people to discover me there. I don't want my, you know, hundreds of thousands of existing Twitter followers or viewers of my show to just also follow me on Alexa. Cause that's not adding anything. I already have them. I would say to that, it is adding something because you're making yourself available in the cool new medium that is hands-free, convenient, and naturally ergonomic to every person on the planet with no learning curve, which is voice. Um, but it's, it's hard to grow a new audience anywhere, especially in a medium that has discoverability challenges, like voice, like podcasting. So I mean, this is all, it's part of the, the concert of the marketing instruments. They play yeah, together. Those existing people love it. They're more likely to tell other people about it. Like yes. they become ambassadors. And I, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm, I'm a fan of, uh, yeah, do everything you can. Your employee base, if you work at a large company, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, making sure that everybody inside your company knows about it. They're also wonderful ambassadors to be able to share it with their friends and family or their networks or those sorts of things. Those are all, you know, different ways of putting it in front of the right people. Yeah. And just do something worth sharing. I mean, that's a very Seth Godin-esque way to look at it, which makes sense. Like make something good. People will talk about it and you won't have to, which is, is the, the root of podcasting. Thing. Yeah. Like it's like, it, it is, you can't buy listens in, in podcasts, you know, like the, you, yeah, have, that's, you have to earn well it by said. being great. So yeah. yeah. Um, have you heard of the app Good Pods? I have not. Okay. I just had JJ Ramberg on the show a couple weeks ago. She's the co-founder. It's like the good reads for podcasts. Oh, that's awesome. And it's something that as far as I know, I haven't seen anything else like it. And it's about discoverability. Basically it takes like social media where you follow your friends, but the only thing people post about is podcasts. And it also has a podcast player within it. So you go, oh, here's what Steve's listening to. I haven't heard that episode of Ologies play. And then I can rate it and share it in my feed to my followers. So the discoverability, super cool. it's yeah. cool. It's totally cool. You should check it out. Uh, but like the indexing and the transcription and all of these things that we need, they're getting there. But it's, it's funny because this, you know, we hit 50% of the U.S. population have listened to a podcast in 2019. It's a great stat. It's like, yeah, finally, this has been cool for years. You guys are getting it now. Um, but the, the discoverability thing, and that's in voice, same problem, same thing. It's almost like you have to cross over mediums. You can't discover Alexa skills with voice very well. You have to actually go in and type, tap, tap, type, and swipe in an app to find a voice skill. It's just early days. Well, it's, it's, it's funny. Even, even when I was talking about kind of the, the superpowers of brands to be able to, to reach people. So we, we think that brands are going to be able to grow a lot of new podcast listeners if they make great shows. I think it's the same thing with smart speaker skills. Like you'll correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, but you know, if you could get more people understanding like what's the phrase that I say to the smart speaker and you're using all sorts of other channels and it's just like a concerted campaign to say like, say this, say this to your smart speaker. Um, that's how people get used to using them. Like that's how that, that builds comfort and, and reduces friction. And I think that the brands that can reach you and talk to a lot of people when they start experimenting more and understanding the, the possibilities of, of smart speakers, uh, they're going to realize that they, they have a big advantage there to drive adoption as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think the education component is key with any new technology. Like when we first had smartphones, you had to teach people how to download an app 
and how to close an app. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, you swipe up, you exit out. You have to make sure they're all closed. There's too many running at once. Your phone's slowing down. It's like, we didn't know. And then it becomes second nature and you can't live without it. That's where voice is headed, I would say. Um, ambient computing, everything voice controlled. And then this is why podcasting is so important to me, why it's so exciting. Because if we think of all the other content that we're producing that is text-based, it doesn't have it much of a home when people are using voice and they're moving throughout their day throughout different environments. Like, sure, there's multimodal, there's a smart display here, but as I walk to the car, it sinks over to my earbuds and then I don't have a visual anymore. So the content has to be voice activated. I get so excited about thinking about, you know, just audio search and audio search results and where the future of that's going to go. Like to your point is, um, I just feel like there's entirely new universes of content that are going to come out of smart speakers that are different lengths and formats than anything that's in podcasting right now that are just hugely efficient uh, and, and well done answers to questions and search queries. And I, I don't think, I, like, I've, I've been excited about it for like two years. <laughs> and it's not, it's not there yet, but it feels like it's almost inevitable that how do the best how do the best answers to common questions come up in audio on smart speakers that are not, you know, AI reading the first paragraph of Wikipedia? Sure. Yeah. sure. And the thing with Wikipedia is anybody can write for Wikipedia. And also there's a lot of bias in Wikipedia because you know who writes the vast majority of Wikipedia articles. Well, for one thing, it tends to be mostly men. So we're missing some voices there. It's not always verified anyway, but that's the thing. Like if you are a brand, one of the brands that works with specific content, I mean, this is like the lowest hanging fruit of voice search. Ask a few different voice assistants, who is BMW or who is Charles Schwab or, you know, what does this company do and see what they say. And if it's not the answer that you want, if you're not controlling that message, you need to go in and update that and modify that. There, there are ways to do it, but it's also still like a little bit of the wild west of figuring out how to make that happen sometimes. Well, it feels like it's an interesting time for experiments. Uh, you know, I think honestly, even, even in this, pandemic scenario where, um, you know, I, I, I wrote a blog post this week around kind of this shift in priority thinking where like the first chunk of, of the whole pandemic and lockdown was like urgent and on fire and, and important, like in that urgent versus important matrix, yep. um, <laughs> but it's all been urgent and important, but where I feel like we're starting to shift into this important, but non-urgent where we can do some really interesting big picture thinking and we can experiment a little bit more and do things that are going to have a longer term difference. And I think, I, I hope that because audio is, you know, not dependent on gathering people uh, and you can do audio production really well remotely, I would love to see experiments with smart speakers coming out of this. Like I would love to see people thinking about like, what's my audio SEO strategy? We have it on the web. We know what our top 10 or 15, you know, questions that we want to be the answer to what does an audio version of that look like and just put it out and see what, see what happens like test and learn in small pieces would be a, a ton of fun to see more companies experimenting with that. I know it's probably also a, a tough time for marketing dollars. So it's, uh, it's trade-offs. Right. But it's the kind of thing where this is one of the most important times to not cut your marketing budget. This is, it's a common mistake companies make. They think it's expendable with no marketing no one's going to know who you are, what you're selling or why it matters. And then you don't have sales and then you don't have revenue and you have nothing. So um, what you were saying though, with, with smart speakers and audio SEO or voice search optimization, whatever you want to call it, this is huge. I mean, this is really important because if you look at smart speakers are, or they're like the training wheels of voice. The voice assistant is on many more devices than just the smart speaker, but that's kind of the, the entry point that we all understand and associate with it because it was first 2014 early echo but we had a 70 percent year-over-year increase in global shipments of smart speakers in 2019 over 2018 and voice in the car is actually the fastest growing and number one use case of voice voice in the car perfect time to listen to a podcast what about discoverability so this is this is like the next wave i mean if you're doing podcasting you want to be discovered figuring out how to optimize for those kind of searches, especially in the car, is, is going to be a very valuable offering. 
I'm such a, I, I know we said this off the top, like where you're like, we're a team of 30 nerds. We're like, I'm such a dork about this sort of stuff. Um, so I got a new car lease in December and I, I was at the, the dealership and like, well, this has this in, under the hood. Or I'm like, I don't care about any of the stuff <laughs> under the hood. I, all I care about is does this have in dash entertainment system and does it have voice control on it? And it's been like, I, I, to your point, like that's, that's the thing I want is I want frictionless connectivity to stuff on my phone and to be able to have, have Siri and Google assistant and all those sorts of things really easy and frictionless in the car. And it's been such a game changer, just having a decent system yeah. compared to a 10 year old car that <laughs> was, I was just tethering uh, my right. phone into like, before. Oh, let me connect and tether this. So, like at a half time, it doesn't work. No, you're, you're not alone. I think the stat was something like 65 or 70% of new car buyers list. Is it natively voice enabled as one of their top two requirements? Yeah, I, I, I literally left one car company because they're like, well, we're, we'll be getting that we'll get it. in the 21, <laughs> 2021 version or something. I'm like, well, it's, I, I, that's the only deciding factor for me between this and like five other models that are very similar. So it's, it's funny. And I have to say like, you know, to your, to your point around voice versus smart speakers, like I think that's the thing I'm, you know, I've, I've been super interested in what Google's been doing in the podcast space um, around, around all of this. And I think I'm, I hope I'm not butchering the term, but it's I think it's device interoperability, is is the way that they talk about it, where you can move seamlessly from, you know, I'm listening to a podcast on my Google Home, and then I walk out the door and I get into my car and it picks up the same podcast exactly where I left off, and then I get to the grocery store and I put in my headphones and it picks up the podcast exactly where I left off on my headphones. That's that frictionless experience that I think is that they're doing a really, really good job of, of leading on. And um, just having that whole ecosystem built out feels like a, like a huge advantage for them. Absolutely. And what you're describing is one of the most beloved features of Audible, which is that you can be reading on your Kindle and then listening on your Echo Buds or wherever else you're plugged in. It's the syncing, yeah. which is the ambient computing. Um, absolutely. Uh, so we wanted to also make sure we touch on this part of the show, which is the fun part. And because you're a podcast wizard and extremely knowledgeable about all the best podcasts out there, let us know the audience, me, uh, what are you listening to lately? Any podcasts that you would recommend or specific episodes even? Uh, so I think, you know, the, the pandemic and all the changes to society have been like top of mind for me as a business that's, you know, fairly quickly shut down our office and moved to remote work like we were I think we were very well suited to that so we we did it more seamlessly maybe than um than I had been expecting and it, it was wonderful and our team has been great with it but I think I've I've been doubling down on trying to listen to how to think about work differently um you know remotely and beyond and there's a fantastic episode of the making sense podcast with Sam Harris, uh, where his guest was Matt Mullenweg from Automatic, which is the company that runs WordPress. And he has this kind of theory about the five stages of remote work for companies of kind of like beginner. It's almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs of just like building up this pyramid where you, you know, the, the basics, and then you end up at Nirvana at the, at the top end of it. But it's a really interesting listen for anybody who wants to think differently about remote work. Uh, and I've been reading uh, a book that I've ha I've wanted to read for a long time. Uh, it just feels like it's more important now. Uh, called the Art of Gathering by Priya Parker, and it's a it's a kind of rethinking meetings and why you have meetings. You know, I, th I think as we've ended up in just endless Zoom calls, or or as people shift to remote, they don't they're not really thinking about the right tools for the right reasons. And um, anyways, it's, it's a really interesting book to make you think about when to have meetings or not and how to make them effective or not. And it's not written for remote work, but I feel like it's super valuable for that. Okay. Well, we'll have links to everything that we've mentioned uh, in the show notes at beetlemoment.com slash podcast. This is episode 69 with Steve Pratt. You can find links to everything we've talked about. And beyond that, Steve, let people know where they can connect with you. 
Uh, Pacific-content.com is our website and our, uh, our blog, you know, you're mentioning education is one of the biggest things. That's where we put out all of our thinking about podcasting too, um, is, is blog.pacific-content.com. Great. Great. Okay. Well, Pacific content, um, you have so many great podcasts, but if I had to say a few of my favorites, I love Choiceology from Schwab. I think there's a really cool new episode coming out that you mentioned, right? Yeah, well, they've actually done a really great one. So it's a, it's a show about how to make better decisions. Uh, and it's hosted by a behavioral psychologist who's just amazing named Katie Milkman at uh, yeah. Wharton. Uh, so she actually had uh, Lori Santos, who's the professor behind the most popular course ever at Yale around the science of happiness. And, and she hosts a podcast called The Happiness Lab. So they kind of got together for an impromptu, like how do we deal with everything that is going on right now from a behavioral psychology point of view. And I loved it. It was great. Lots of good info in there. Yes. Uh, okay. So many great podcasts to go listen to. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been really great talking with you. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been really nice to meet you and, uh, and have a chat. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. Me too.